So ladies and gentlemen, please let me introduce the father of the iPod, Tony Fidel. You know, we've talked about a lot of things, and I thought uh, uh, a little history might be a good idea to talk a little bit about your background. And, and probably the first thing that may be familiar to a lot of people is uh, General Magic, which was one of your first companies, I believe, right, or worked for. Yeah, General Magic was really the first pro company that I worked for, and I got to work with my heroes. This was the creators of the Macintosh, and they had spun out of Apple and created, really, an iPhone 20 years before the iPhone uh, before the iPhone came to market. And I learned so much about engineering. I learned from my heroes. Got my PhD in design and engineering there. And, and that kind of set my career. And, and it, it set a lot of people's careers. Actually, the person who, uh, Andy Rubin, uh, he was the um, creator of Android, which maybe a lot of you guys have, the competitor of the iPhone. He was there. He was in the Cube Next. We had all kinds of amazing people at that company. Yeah, Forbes called it like, the most important dead company in Silicon Valley. Absolutely. That spawned so many. Yeah, the dead company. We had eBay come out of there. We had Web TV. Many, many different companies. So it was a great experience to kind of, when you said working for your heroes, it was really part of the deal. Absolutely. Um, you know, for me, when I when I look at, so you, you, you had this idea for the MP3 player and, and wanting to come out with it, and at the time, it just seemed like a very crowded market. I mean, and I would never have thought there was an opportunity. So, so how did you guys decide back in 2001, I think, the time frame, that there was an opportunity in the market for that? Well, really, it was all about music. So iPod was about taking all the music with you wherever you wanted to go. And what the precursor of the iPod was iTunes. And iTunes was on a Macintosh, was all about creating your own mixed CDs at the time. And the iTunes folks were trying to create uh, 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 iTunes that would be compatible with the MP3 players in the marketplace. And so they were hooking different products up and they were like, this is not a good experience. There's all these different players, we can innovate. And so they called me up. I had a startup company at the time doing MP3 players. They called me up and said, hey, could you come and contract for us? And, uh, and we came up with the design in six weeks and showed it to Steve Jobs. And in that meeting, it was green-lighted and off to the races we were. So and it, was, it was iTunes. A lot of times, it was iTunes pulling you into that a lot. Because right. iTunes existed and there wasn't something good that fit with iTunes. Everyone sees the iPod and goes, oh, it was all about the iPod. It was the combination of iPod plus iTunes, which is what made the iPod so successful and, and then started Apple on its you know, rejuvenation. Legit, 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 legit. You mentioned that uh, Steve Jobs was a little more, there's some controversy yeah. over Windows. And, and <laughs> absolutely. Windows, I think. Absolutely. Well, the big thing with uh, uh, with the iPod was this was about the thing to bring people over to the Mac. They said, if you want to get an iPod, you have to buy a Mac. And there was a little bit of a flawed logic, and so we had a little uh, uh, scumworks team creating the iPod uh, software on the on the on the PC. And Steve said, never, 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 never. And it took about 18 months, and finally um, he was convinced, and we brought the iPod to the PC, and that's when it really began. Uh, a success. Yeah, so you know, for someone like me, I, I was a, a, a Windows guy, right? I didn't have any Macintosh at all, but because of that, I purchased one of the iPods, and it, it, it was like crap. It sucked me in. <laughs> and, you know, now I have iPods, iPads, well, iPhones, iMacs, I got everything. My family has them. Well, well, that was the thesis. The thesis was if you could buy an Apple product for $249 or $299, and you had a great experience, Maybe you would actually then buy some a buy up a lot. And you guys, did you really think that was this was going to be the, the, the initiator for that? Is well, that well there were some of us who believed it. There was other people who didn't. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, we obviously history went out. And we, <laughs> we see what's the right thing. But who would have thought that you know something like the iPod would then grow up into the iPhone and then the iPad? And literally, it was a total reverse way of thinking about how to do product design. Most people, most competitors, they're starting with a PC and trying to make it small. We started out with a music player and made it big. So it was, a, it was an amazing, you know, nine years that I had there at the company. And so it was just tremendous. Well, you know, we, we got designers, mechanical engineers, we have people that are into the whole, the, the nuts and bolts of kind of what you guys did. 
So I know, I think it, maybe we can talk a little bit about some of the design process of, you know, the evolution of the iPod, you know, maybe, you know and um, maybe uh, talk about some of the decisions going from the first generation to what it currently is. Well, the whole reason why the iPod is the way it, you know, it was at the time was because new technology was being embraced. Right? It was the first time you had a, a, a lot of storage that could fit in your pocket. And if you look at all the transitions of the iPod, it was all around the storage capability of the device. And that's how it went from the, the iPod is the first iPod to then the iPod Mini, then the iPod Nano, and then the iPod Shuffle. All of those were because there were significant advances in storage technology and, and then over time computing technology to allow us to put more and more features. And then that was a precursor to then what became the iPod because we had so much capability, we had all the music, all the uh, all videos, those kinds of things, and all the connections back in the network. Then we needed to add the cell phone. And so there was a very interesting, a very, very interesting uh, transition from the iPod to the iPhone, because we were like trying to make an iPod plus a phone, and what would that look like? And so we actually made one of those, and obviously that didn't come to market. And through three actual generations of products we threw out, it finally became the iPhone, <laughs> iPhone that you know of today. Cool. Um, were there any real big challenges? Like, did you have any uh, design, design, anything critical that you guys didn't know how to get over, or was there something that surprised you? Everything's a surprise. Yeah. Everything's a surprise. You know this in, in, in your work, right? There's nothing that's really predictable when you're really pushing the edge. You're pushing the edge so much that you don't know if you can get the software done in time. Or can you actually manufacture millions of them with the same exacting uh, tolerances, right? You're trying to make the thinnest walls or, or CNC the, 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 the most intricate metals. All of those things are really, really uh, pushing the edge. And I, and I think we're going to talk about this in a, in a few minutes, but you know, you, you're talking about industrial designers, talking about mechanical designers, you're talking about a whole group of people all working together and, and bringing them... Um, the, the only way you can pull off any of these things is by a multidisciplinary team of people who treat each other as peers. Each person, some people go, oh, I'm an artist, I'm an engineer, what have you. I believe that everyone, if they do a great job, they are artists of their work. What they do, they bring their passion, their emotion, their talent, the best, with other people who have other pa passions and talents. And combining those together and, and having creative tension creative tension in a positive manner, not about personal, but about making the best product. That's how you get there. You have to be critical about what you do and about what other people do, but only in, insofar as making that product better. And you have to be able to look each other in the eye at the end and say, yes, we made the best product, and yes, I didn't win every decision, but you know what? It's because we made a better product. And so a lot of times there's this, there's this clash between I'm an industrial designer, I'm an engineer, I'm a mechanical designer. It's all of us working together because that's the only way uh, that these products are created. And that includes operations, that includes industrial engineers and manufacturing engineers. Because we can't just make something that's pretty, we have to make millions of, of, of copies of that and make each atom work exactly the same way as the original design. And getting rid of the click wheel was probably a controversial decision at some point, or was that? Well, the, the wheel first started out. Right, it was a mechanical wheel, then we went to electronic wheel. Then we integrated buttons into it because the products kept getting smaller. And over time, the wheel kept evolving. And then at some point, there was just an opinion that said, people like everything to be touch-based, so <coughs> let's just get rid of it. So sometimes there are fact-based decisions, and there's other opinion-based decisions. And you have to know inside your company who really makes the opinion-based decisions and who makes the fact-based ones. There's always a little tension around that. So someone's got to make the decisions. You have to have someone who is a true editor of the product who can say, this is what I want and this is what I don't want. Design by committee never works. You know, um, we talked about General Magic and we talked about Apple. And is there any comparison? Is there anything to learn? Because one was successful, one wasn't. And I'm not sure, you know, how, how did you, what, what did you learn out of those things? Well, I was very young at General Magic, and, and what I learned there was I was working with amazing, very, very smart people, but there wasn't a clear focus, a clear vision, a clear goal. They had a rabbit, though. They had a rabbit. That was fun. <laughs> I don't know if you know, but at General Magic, they were the tourist rabbit and a rabbit that ran around the office. We, right? we had a rabbit, and he would do more than just run around the office. Uh, he would leave a little trail behind him. 
But uh, needless to say, we, you know, I learned a lot about how to engineer things, but how to really make a great product. It's not just about engineering a great product, it's also about sales and marketing and, and, and communications and so many other factors, documentation and packaging. That's the other, and that's the key magic of Apple. Lots of people can create great products, but can you actually sell them? And uh, that's, that's a very, very difficult thing because every single person, not just the ID person, not the mechanical person, but also the sales and marketing people have to be passionate about the product that they're going to create. Well, so you said good segue into what you're doing today. So let's talk a little bit about your, uh, your company. And Our little baby here. Yeah, little baby. Nest. So the Nest Learning Thermostat, what's it about? Well, you saw the video. We just went to re revolutionize what a thermostat is in your home. Everyone said, are you crazy? My wife came to me, are you going to make a thermostat? They're the most unsexy thing in the world. And I was like, no, you can actually make it beautiful. You can make it engaging. You can make it sexy. You can make it fun. And you can actually save energy at the same time. And I said, I looked at it. Said, this is a very difficult problem. Actually, this is a smartphone. This is an iPhone inside it. Very few companies can actually make it. So we decided, with a group of friends and people I've worked with for the last 20 years, we felt we were going to be passionate about this. And we have 100 people who are the most passionate people you could ever imagine, all concerned about your heating and cooling and your thermostat, if you could go believe that. So how'd you, yes, come, up, how'd you come up with the idea? I was just frustrated. I was, I was designing a green home in Lake Tahoe, and I wanted to have a, a uh, uh, you know, as green a home as possible, we're putting solar and geothermal wells and the best heating and cooling. And then they said, for 400 hours, we're going to put this thing on your wall. Yeah. And I was like, you got to be kidding. Gonna Get break. out of my way. I'm going to go, I'm going to go find one on the internet. There's got to be a better one. And I was frustrated. Yeah. Frustrated. So I designed my own. A lot of beige in the, in the ones available on the market. A lot of beige plastic. It reminded me of computers in yeah. the mid-90s. Yeah. Everyone was making the same square looking boxes with the same features. Right. This reminds me, though, I mean, do you feel this a lot like uh, it's the same feeling that you had when you were doing the iPod and the, when the iPhone was coming out? Do you have the kind of same? A absolutely. The, you know, it's just about a small team of people working passionately together. And a lot of the people that I have, actually my co-founder, he was an intern. He was an intern from, uh, my first intern on iPods. Yeah, he was an apprentice. He was our apprentice and, and he came up and now he's my co-founder with me at Nest. And, it's just wonderful to be able to work with the people that I've worked with in the industry for over 20 years to be able to create stuff like this. Because, you know, it's about having fun. It's about changing the world and having a lot of fun with people that you love to do. Do you want to talk a little bit more about what this thing does and how it does it? Well, let's see. I can tell you, you know, you dial the temperature, yes, and you tell it what you want. But more importantly, uh, the, the big innovation here is that it's a learning thermostat. The, uh, here we have a bunch of sensors in the, in the bottom, and it actually senses when you're around in the house. And if you're not around for two or three hours during waking hours, it actually goes into an energy savings mode. So a lot of people are busy, they don't have time to go and turn down their thermostat or put it in their way mode. It simply does it for you. Also, you can control it with any iP uh, 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 iPhone or iPad or any web browser, an Android device, from anywhere in the world. And that comes well built in. So we decided to make a, a thermostat for the iPhone generation. You guys have all come to appreciate uh, the products that you have in your pocket. You really love and, and, and cherish that. But we decided that the other products that are around you that you interact with, especially ones that can cost you a lot of money, you can, a thermostat can consume $15,000, $20,000 worth of energy during its lifetime. You want to make sure you use a product that's actually going to treat that energy well and help you to try to save money and hopefully some CO2 and, and help the planet. <laughs> yeah, and it's all about just making, I mean, everybody's got programmable thermostats, but they don't, people don't do it. And this is going to be something where you don't have to program it, it will learn for you, it will program itself. And you guys, did you have any numbers or any quantities for how much you estimate the, the saving, the potential savings? So, so today, there are a quarter of a billion thermostats residential thermostats and light commercial thermostats in the U.S., a quarter of a billion. Ninety percent of those are never programmed to save any energy because it's too cumbersome. So what we've done is we made a learning thermostat that watches your, your interactions and learns from that and then plays it back. And so through that and the auto away functions and some other, other interesting things that we have in the product, we believe that in most places you can save between 10 and 30 percent, 20 and 30 percent. We've seen as high as 60 percent in certain areas. 
So you can save money. So a fifteen a, a product that's two hundred fifty dollars could end up saving you thousands of dollars if it's used properly. Right. You know, it's a tough question, but how come someone else hasn't done this? You know, I know that's one of them. In the same way that you, it seems obvious, doesn't it? Sometimes you look at it in retrospect, but... Well, we came at it from a very different angle. We understood the technologies, we understood the services, we understood how to make a cell phone. And when, if you look at a thermostat, it's much more like a cell phone than it is a light switch. Because really, thermostats, all they are are kind of light switches. So this is all the connectivity, the services, the, the, the mobile clients, all of those things had to come together to make a next generation thermostat. And many of the companies that are out there today not their market. That's not their market. They make cell phones. Right, right. Um, so you saw some of Yes, we did. And let's, let's talk a little bit about the SolidWorks and maybe more. <laughs> so obviously we need a language. We need a communications tool between industrial design and the engineers and manufacturing and all of our suppliers to be able to pull together a product like this in as quickly as we did. And we did it with a very small team. I'd say we probably did it with about eight people. We did, we did the design, all the mechanicals, electronics, with about eight to 10 people. And we needed a tool to do that. And SolidWorks brought it all together for us and allowed us to you know, create the, the renders, the models, so we can, we can rule out certain things. We were able to then communicate with the factories to actually build real prototypes because I, well, as much as I love rendering and 3D modeling, you still need to see the product, you need to touch it, you need to you need to experience it before you can actually sign off on the design. Yeah, and prototypes aren't just 3D printing. You're talking about real physical mock -up. You're talking about... We make it look exactly identical to what we thought it was. So we actually had craftsmen around the world creating each of the parts by hand, and then we would hand assemble it, and then we would put it in our hands and say, yes, does this feel right? Does it look right? Put it on the wall, see how the light hits the, the different angles, and we would tweak that. Because there's nothing uh, like actually having the real physical model there. You can see how the light cheats it and makes it look thinner than it really is. Those are the kind of things you have to do in the real world. But if you don't have the tools to get you to this point, you'll be, you, uh, you know, you'll be so much more uh, handicapped. No, um, everyone's talking about uh, Facebook and Twitter and stuff, and, and something else that you've kind of done differently is you've Instead of being a, a tool for contractors and scholars, you gotta really go more to directly to, to the customer. And so I guess the question is, how's Facebook and Twitter affecting or impacting your, your company or other tools? So, so th th those are in, in, those are incredibly important. Actually, <laughs> what we do is we dis we discovered uh, uh, back to your uh, uh, question about innovation in this category. The big reason why there hasn't been another set of innovation in this category was because they were being built and designed for the contractor channel. All the thermostats that were out there were being designed because contractors bought them and then they would tell you what to buy and install it in your house. We decided we were going directly to the consumer. We are going to go to the consumer, say, you want this, and as soon as you get educated, then you're going to tell your contractors what you want. So we wanted to design a consumer product from the get-go. And that means getting interaction from the consumers when they got the first devices, what they liked, what they didn't like. And we've made um, significant product modifications after getting our first Twitter feeds, our first uh, Facebook feeds, to, to you know, make this graphic a little bit better. Oh, that menu doesn't work exactly right. So we went in and made all these different tweaks to the product just since we introduced it in October. We're already on version 1.2 of the software. And um, those are the kind of things that you have to get directly from your customers. And uh, th these tools are just wonderful to do that. So you're, you're actually you, you, you're monitoring it live, obviously, as much as you can. And, and we mo we you monitor it. Your, so you're almost doing tech support or finding issues through those. We have a full traditional customer service support, email, phone, those kinds of things. But we also Twitter, Flickr, uh, Pinterest, Facebook. We have a whole set of people just going over the social sites and, and, and learning and hearing from our customers exactly what they like and what they don't like about the product. 